filmed entirely in black and white over 12 days in a single field in England. A, well, field in England is the psychedelic psychological folk horror fantasy set during the 17th century English Civil War. The film opens in the cowardly shoes of an alchemist's assistant called Whitehead, who's on the run from his commander Trower before the commander is abruptly killed in the midst of an ethereal conflict by a rugged soldier called Cutler. I say ethereal rather than literal because we never see any of the thousands of soldiers who lay down their lives for opposite sides of their country, given the film's severely limited, although strategically utilised, £300,000 budget. However, while in premise it makes the film sound cheap, it helps in establishing the surreal and eerie atmosphere that persists throughout, as the distant sounds of death and battle take on an almost haunting ghostly effect, as the shell-shocked and traumatised Whitehead struggles to make sense of what should be familiar surroundings. Cutler and Whitehead quickly team up with two other deserters, Jacob and Friend, and what initially ensues is a fashionably English quest to locate a local alehouse to have a nice cold pint and wait for all this civil war to blow over. Now, that's not exactly the most compelling sell for a horror film, but trust me, if you want to see Britain's version of Ravenous meets the lighthouse, this is well and truly it. Before we dive any deeper, this video is sponsored by Vezzy. When it comes to footwear, there is no marriage more perfect than style meets practicality, and as I boasted on this channel for many years now, Vezzy's have become my ultimate go-to footwear for every condition and every occasion. Whether it be walking cheddar in Ireland's typically cold summer, or walking over 30 minutes each blistering hot morning in Austria to compete in the Dodgeball World Championships, Vezzy's have elevated my urban style with their new courtside classic shoes. These bad boys have been my comfort shoes throughout my entire time in Austria. In fact, I've literally been wearing them courtside when coaching and warming up outside playing shoes because their slip-resistant rubber and non-marking outsole provide excellent traction and their cushion insole provides light shock absorption for the non-stop moving about. With the constant sweating and a 30 plus Celsius heat wave, Vezzy Courtside Classics provide remarkable breathability to keep my feet nice and relaxed and their Dymatex material makes Courtside Classics scarily waterproof for sudden weather changes, as well as just making them all round easier to clean. The vibrant modern style of Quartzite Classics gives me confidence in whatever I'm wearing, making them perfect for casual walks, social occasions, or getting me through the intensity of coaching multiple matches a day. You can kickstart your city adventures today with Vezzy and discover vintage style and modern comfort at vezzy.com slash ryanhollinger or clicking the QR code on screen to find the perfect blend of style and practicality and enjoy an instant 15% off your first order at checkout. A Field in England is aggressively niche to say the least. It's an experimental art film directed by Ben Wheatley, who I've praised several times before for his work on Free Fire, Sightseers, Down Terrace and Kill List, which I cover many moons back, and it's the sort of film that defies any concrete genre, hence why I give it five descriptions, a psychedelic psychological folk horror fantasy. Hell, some of you might even feel compelled to add dark comedy in there, especially given the cast are made up of comedians and comedy actors like Julian Barrett, Michael Smiley, and Reese Shearsmith, the latter of whom's work on The League of Gentlemen, Psychoville, and Inside Number 9 is a good barometer for how you might feel about this film's British sensibilities. If you're still not sold on where the film is going, the gist is that these men eventually team up with a mysterious wizard to locate an obscure hidden treasure whilst they're all high on magic mushrooms, with a particular emphasis on the magical part when they begin lapsing into worrisome hallucinations. Funnily enough, this isn't actually the first magic mushroom horror I've seen. There's an Irish slasher flick called Shrooms, where a bunch of American students take mushrooms and get murdered by a mysterious killer, and you'll see the twist coming a mile away. Anyway, for context before we dive back into the field, Wheatley has described the film as a vignette of England's early fairy tale and folklore traditions, particularly when what was initially deemed as magic was finally being recognised as science, while superstitious magic became disassociated with religion due to its leanings with the occult. Like Robert Eggers' The Witch, A Field in England isn't designed with explanation or exposition in mind, instead choosing to entrench us in the fears and oddities around heaven and hell at the time, with the characters reacting in spontaneous ways that feel natural for the time period. Out the gate, most people will view A Field in England as an overt allegory for purgatory, and Wheatley himself even acknowledges the obvious connection, even if he himself never strictly and 
intended as such. What I particularly love about Wheatley's use of ambiguity is that he never forces any obtruse meaning into his films, because it would end up feeling contrived when his stories are typically told from an innocuous point of view, and instead notes that the eventual magic mushroom catalyst is a play on the English occult superstition around mushroom circles, where it's believed those within it are trapped in a dangerous place. Wheatley, as a storyteller, embodies both Stanley Kubrick and David Lynch, in that if you want an explicit answer, all you'll get is a shoulder shrug followed by the sentiment to take it for what it is. In my interpretation, I see a field in England much like how the characters simply describe it. It's a fable about deserters being punished by the devil, who forces them to dig their own graves under the guise that what they're searching for is treasure, only for the revelation to be that it's nothing more than a skull, a symbol of death, but that will all make sense eventually. Back in the field, when their journey begins, Whitehead fears the consequences of their desertion, only for Friend to reassure him that they're merely shadows in this realm, forgotten men left to rot with the dead and fertilize the soil, perhaps serving as its own poetic justice that death will inevitably catch up with them. Later in the day, Cutler makes the men soup using mushrooms from the ground, but Whitehead refuses to eat it due to his religious fasting, prompting his suspicion that Cutler might be up to something. This soon rings true when the men discover and drag an injured man out from below the ground surrounding the mushrooms, who goes by the name O'Neill, whom Cutler is revealed to be working for, and whom Whitehead reveals has stolen grimoire passages from his master, and thus must be detained so Whitehead can retrieve the documents. O'Neill immediately proves himself to be the significant driving force behind the film's tension. He's shrouded in mystery and exudes a calm yet boorish presence onto Whitehead, tapping into his his distinct Northern Irish demeanour to make him appear powerful and indisputable. O'Neill ominously alludes to the strange circumstances being destined, having seemingly conjured Whitehead to seek the treasure, mocking him as merely a puppet to the cause, even assuming command of the group without any question or resistance, despite the vulnerable state they first find him in. Interestingly, there's both humour and meaning found in Friend calling him a devil disguised as an Irishman which soon comes into barbaric effect when the next scene sees O'Neill brutally torture Whitehead from inside a tent which we never see, as Whitehead deafens the world with his agonizing screams for mercy. The torturous horror is left to our imagination, but eventually Whitehead emerges in a freakishly zombified state, almost as though lobotomized or possessed into being O'Neill's literal puppet. The calming synth music mixed with the slow motion of the cheerfully deranged Whitehead is both uncanny and unnerving, as he becomes a mindless dog tasked with locating the treasure. This takes us to the exact halfway point in the film, where they discover the treasure is literally located exactly where they began, outside O'Neill's tent. You can see what I mean by calling this a fable about deserters being punished by the devil into digging their own graves, because it's as though O'Neill knew the treasure was right under his nose this entire time, but wanted to prolong the cycle of their suffering. What ensues is Whitehead, Friend, and Jacob struggling to dig for the treasure, only for Friend to be accidentally shot by Cutler during a dispute, leading to O'Neill forcing Cutler to continue digging the hole himself as a punishment for his own arrogance. Arrogance. What he eventually finds is nothing more than a skull, arguably being that of another group who went through the same purgatorial punishment as these men, and the cycle is now repeating itself. But more importantly, it symbolises that the true treasure was always inevitable death, with Cutler being granted it when executed by O'Neill for calling him out as the manipulative domineering liar he always was. During this, Whitehead does come back to his senses, but remains distraught at having his spiritual dignity deprived of him by O'Neill. He begins experiencing his own hallucinations due to the effects of O'Neill's wine, which inspire him to finally fight back and regain control of himself, soon consuming an ungodly amount of mushrooms and summoning a storm to disrupt O'Neill's power. Whitehead proceeds to naturally trip balls by having mirrored visions of O'Neill as though fighting to be the same man, one of power and dominance, a contrast to the prisoner Whitehead has always figuratively been. 
Wadley has described the psychedelic visuals as purely a visceral assault on the senses, but symbolically he also interprets it as a regurgitation of the film's events, where Whitehead is rewiring his reality, thus basically becoming an entirely different person in the end. He teams up with Jacob to take down O'Neill, but Jacob is soon fatally shot by O'Neill, who seemingly conjures friend back from the dead to blow their cover, but has his own leg shot off in the process, leaving Whitehead to freely sneak up behind an injured O'Neill and execute him from point blank. Surprisingly, there is humour found when Jacob asks if there ever truly was a treasure, prompting Whitehead to respond with, I swear to God, that the treasure was the friendship all along the way, much to Jacob's sardonic acceptance that Whitehead is simply trying to apply purpose to a meaningless quest. As the storm finally settles, Whitehead takes O'Neill's wardrobe, embracing the powerful persona for himself and giving Jacob and friend a Christian burial in the treasure dig, thus solidifying the premise of digging their own graves. If we're sticking with the symbolism of men being punished by the devil or death in purgatory, Whitehead has effectively taken his place. He produces more of the magic mushroom soup he once rejected, and taking his master's property, finally leaves the mysterious field, returning to where it all began, ready to escape from his purgatorial slumber as a new, empowered man, no longer a prisoner to anyone else. However, as the cries of battle reform and Whitehead emerges from the field exactly where we first saw him, we see friend Jacob and Whitehead in O'Neill's form. Perhaps they're now ghosts of war, destined to remain in purgatory, but for Whitehead, he's finally become the version of himself he's always wanted to be. But not necessarily for the better, when he'll likely become consumed by the very same power that corrupted O'Neill. Whitehead's journey is about a coward finding strength, but ultimately when he does find that strength, it's simply him overtaking the shadow of another man who abused and tormented him. He figuratively and literally becomes his own worst enemy, someone who, in his eyes and in the words he's attempted to preach, gave into blasphemy and defied the power of and wrath of God, just so he could experience being his own soulless version of God in a desolate field of men with no true power of their own. Uh, to be honest, I have no clue how this video will go down with folks, so I hope you enjoyed this little detour. Uh, please leave your requests in the comments below as always, and until next time, stay safe, stay away from magic mushrooms, and I'll see you all very soon. Bye.